bullshit. I don't know what to do. <laughs> Kathy Ireland is going to join me in the second hour. She's quite the mogul. Oh, yeah. Billions. Two billion dollars worth oh. of uh, company that she owns. I don't think it's public. And uh, bigger than Martha Stewart. Whew. Is it a lifestyle brand? Yes, it's clothes, yeah. home goods. No shit. Well, let's not forget the most important category, mm. flooring. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, man. Not just throw pillows. Everyone needs a floor. That's right. You get up <laughs> out of bed in the morning, you got no floor, you go right to Hades. <laughs> You understand? That's true. You, we would not have... That's true. You go right to the molten core. We would not have society as you know it without right. floors. That's right. Mm, so she got into flooring. So it separated us from the animals. That's right. <laughs> flooring. Yeah. I think they have floors. No, physically. Oh, okay. well, they have dirt, but we have floors. <laughs> Thank That's you. true. We Thank rose up from yeah. the Serengeti and uh, into some, some nice... Um, Snap together, floating uh, IKEA style flooring. That's yeah. exactly right. When the first swamp creatures crawled out of the, of the bog and put up that pergola. primordial soup. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And do they have exercise videos? I don't think so. She, uh, interestingly enough, uh, they wanted her to do like swimsuits, you know, initially. Sure. Makes sense, right? I get the same offers. Mm -hmm. Two pieces mainly, yeah. but um, she said, um, I'd like to do socks. And uh, time. she thought, well, if I could sell socks, I, I can always sell bikinis, but can I sell socks? So she started with socks and then uh, she went to flooring. And when she got it's, into the home goods stuff, so it's, it's a, a real likely. boots on the ground, yeah. tootsies on the ground kind wow. of approach to all this stuff. But uh, you guys are going to hit it off so well. Oh, she, she <laughs> plays it. Listen, I normally like supermodels even when they're not mm -hmm. into flooring. Mm -hmm. But but you had the, she's got something special. You had flooring, and I'm I'm in. <laughs> Sell the decor. I, she does everything. She does you know wedding dresses and destination Jesus. weddings, mm -hmm. and she just figured it out. Apparently, she has an album. Oh yeah, uh, Marilyn McCoo and Billy Davis Jr. It's, or it's something. her label. That album is on on her label. She's got a label. Boy. Um, Oof, uh, shit. So, uh, Renaissance woman. But she's, she's kind of quiet about it. She doesn't do. I had no she's idea. Not up and out in front of everyone. No her, idea, and and can she possible. kick a football? Liz Taylor's her best friend or was her best friend. I didn't see that. Has Liz Taylor's Oscar at her what? house? Yes. Yeah, I did not see that coming. I know. Wow. I did not see that coming. Warren Buffett is a good friend of hers. She's, well, the, I, I buy that seeing as how she's a business mogul. Yeah, just quietly one of the most successful folks out there and humble about it, but uh, I'll get her to brag a little mm -hmm. bit. So uh, we'll, uh, you got that uh, coming up, Tortorich, yes. Interesting story, and I only have maybe 60% of it, so maybe Chris can verify the rest, but the reason, and maybe you, you've noticed this or not, uh, that Oscars never come across like the auction block mm. is because I think there's a rule they instituted at some point where if you want to get rid of your Oscar, you have to offer it back to the Academy first. Right, you can't mm -hmm. pawn it. You can't, exactly. You, can't, you, see, you see Super Bowl rings, you see everything that crosses the auction block, but never Oscars. Yeah, yeah can't true. You have to sell it back for one dollar ah. before selling it to anyone else. One dollar? Who's gonna <laughs> pay their bills? On? Okay, so um, hardly worth it. Yes. All right. So uh, we'll get into her uh, Tortorich. I was watching his uh, doc Beyond oh, Impossible. Yeah. Interested in a lot of the stuff that was on there. Never thought about some of the stuff that was in there, like uh, the cows and the methane mm -hmm. in India. Yeah, which is something I want to get into with him, which is. We, and he'll put a finer point on it, but um, methane, big deal, mm -hmm. far, I mean, if you're an environmentalist. Mm -hmm. Cow farts, burps. And cow farts and burps. Mm -hmm. But methane dissipates after 10 years. It doesn't go up there. Whatever's coming out of your exhaust pipe is there forever. Right. But the methane kind of cycles, cycles every like 10 years. So if you have cows... Uh, you are essentially cycling through their methane so that it never really gets any bigger than what it is because some is being added, the other sloughing off. But in India, where they love some cows, Worship them, but they don't kill them. Yeah. They just keep it's adding. We yeah. kill them. And so they go away and they stop farting a little bit after they go away. That's mm. probably your last act while you're on this planet. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing, yeah. or at least uh, how we would want to remember you. But 
the Ooh. the in India they love themselves some cows, but they don't eat any cows, so the methane just kind of keeps going. Footnote: Write this down for Doctor Drew next time you guys are in the same room together. When doing an autopsy, does the body release gases? It must, right? Because you're cutting things open, and doesn't it? No. Doesn't it already do that? Like once you get to the autopsy, the gas is probably. I could see some trapped in you know, ten miles, of, you know, intestine or some. Yes, shit. by all means, ask Doctor Drew. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure not he has a, nothing else to talk about. I'm not Doctor Bodden, but <laughs> I am a ceramics major. Oh, I from love high that Doctor Bodden. And we would have to take the clay and we'd have to knead it and really work mm-hmm. all the air out of it because mm-hmm. if you put it in the kiln and had an air bubble, mm-hmm. it would blow up. Yeah, mm. and it would blow up. And you could hear it blow up, and it would take out your project, and everyone else on the shelf in the kiln would get destroyed, too. So that's that, how the girl died in Animal House. That's right. Kiln, wow. explosion. kiln explosion. And to bring this full circle, you know, if you're really making a nice, a real good hamburger with a patty, you have to slap it back and forth to get the air bubbles out. Well, no shit. Yeah. I would that's what the chef make told me. sure if I, if I was a, a, a pathologist, or I was a, sorry, a... a, a what was it? Would it be a corner or something mm-hmm. like that, Dr. Bonza? I would have the body needed before I got hold of it. <laughs> a necro massage? Yeah. Just go full time <laughs> massage, get those elbows, drop some knees, and get all the gas out of that cadaver hey, before honey, I cut it open. Feel free to walk on this body. Do all the walking you need. That's right. Now, there's not going to be the kind of tip you may be no. used to, but... Very little. All right. Uh, Gina brought in something. Oh, oh Dawson's got some Blandino's uh, oh. offerings as well, but you brought in a sign. Uh, I have a sign that has everyone on Reddit Los Angeles up in arms, furious, boycotting this business. And I took one look at the sign and said, Adam's going to like this guy. Mm-hmm. Adam's going to like this shop. You have, have you heard of the place Creation? It's like smoothies. And it's like you've seen, you've passed a, sure. m- that a million times. It's like, sure. it's like a brown, rustic, very expensive, Thankful, like kiosk, uh, like kind of mini restaurant. And they okay. have like teas and smoothies, whatever. And it's spelled Creation with a K. Mm. Well, it seems very hippy dippy, but apparently this sign is on Reddit and it is it does not go with the brand. This is what the, He's the a sign neutral, says. Bro. It says creation, uh, for a hiring sign. Still looking for that special person, you know the one. Actually available, has an open schedule, doesn't cry, is never late, has no excuses, works hard, has no bullshit, smiles no matter what. That one. Think you might be the one? We're hiring. Yeah, well. And people are pissed. I think mm. there's a there's a a problem. And the problem is the people that run businesses are sort of from one generation mm-hmm. because you're in your 50s and you've worked your way through and they all had their shitty jobs at the supermarket right. stocking shelves and they worked at the smoothie place and they've done and they they that's their mindset that's kind of all they all they have and then there's the new generation that has a completely different take on right. what employment mm-hmm. is and it confounds mm-hmm. the older generation. And I got to tell you, it is, uh, as as the older generation who used to work, um, it's a little confounding. Sometimes it's confusing. Mm-hmm. You know, you start hearing stories about, uh, it's Gary's half birthday, but his mom <laughs> wants it to be a surprise. And you're like, half birthday? Who does a half birthday? And, uh, you know, folks playing video games when you're walking out the door with your luggage right. never to come back again. And uh, you start kind of looking around going, what? Something's this off. is not what I'm used to. Yeah. And all I have and all anyone really has is kind of reversing engineering the thing. Well, like when I was 27 and I worked at this place, I certainly would have never done this. But then you see a lot of this, and all you have is your experience. And uh, now the this part, you have to decide whether it's good or bad. But I think we could all argue that showing up late, maybe not showing up at all, mm-hmm. um, many, many other things that the sign may have may have highlighted on it. How much crying are all they doing? Stuff we don't <laughs> look forward to, but they're they're, they're getting <laughs> backlash. Oh, on Reddit they are. And people are say, saying things like, well, maybe for a hundred bucks an hour I could fill all these requirements. Like, this is not this is not the standard anymore. 
Mm. And people are saying, like, mm. I want to interview the employees that left. You know, how, they, they must have abused them if they're making them cry all the time. Like, screw them. Yes, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, the relationship, like, when I was working, I was just an employee. I didn't really expect any... I, I didn't expect the boss to like me or to mm. care about me. It was just, I or was going to know who I was or know who right. I was. I was just going to log hours and mm-hmm. see if I could get paid by the hour. I didn't need much from them. Uh, I needed to impress them is kind of what it is because right. I wanted them to move me up the food chain, but I didn't need them to impress me. It's, it's <laughs> kind of a, I think it's kind of the relationship a lot of people are having with their kids these days. You know, mm-hmm. I, you needed to impress your teachers and your coaches right, and right. your adult parents and your the adult parents of your friends mm-hmm. and things like that. But you didn't need them to prove to you how good they no. were. And you know what definitely didn't impress them? Calling them by their first name. Yeah. That, that was a uh, no starter. It is a new world. Well, like I said, uh, octagons and safe spaces, <laughs> Priuses and Jeeps. I just think we're all just going to mm-hmm. start drifting into our own camps. And uh, there is a, you know, there's probably an opening. Like, the good news is, as I've said to my kids, like, you don't really have to be exceptionally talented anymore. Just do all the stuff that we used to take for granted. That right. is good news, yeah. Just be prompt and be courteous and put a smile on your face and go, will do. And you're going to be the bell of the ball yeah. at your next workplace. Absolutely. You know, we've talked about, and I might have just mentioned it yesterday, when we talk about, like, the new schools are like, eh, they're a little, they don't care if you really show up or do your homework. I'm like, where was this when we were kids? I'm looking at this list. I'm like, oh, these are just suggestions? Like, this isn't the starter? Mm-hmm. This would be a great time for me to go into retail. All right, Dawson, you have some of your own Blandino's offerings? Yeah, I do. I woke right. up from a... Um, You're going to do it in the accent? I can. <laughs> uh, would you like me to start with some from Twitter? Okay, but with the accent. I'll do it. I'll do it all with the accent. But yeah, I woke up from a um, post-apocalyptic nightmare at about four o'clock in the morning. And Mm -hmm. the first thing that came into my mind was Blandino's jokes. (laughs) Weird. So I wrote some down and then worked on them again this morning. But these are some from Twitter. We got the music back. Welcome to Blandino's, where the chef's reputation is as checkered as our tablecloth. Come for the half-baked clams. Stay close to the bathroom. Nice. Good. Blandino's, our creamy Italian dressing, is just mayonnaise and water. Don't forget Blandino's, not so famous, Soso Buco. Ah, good. Soso Buco. Good. Mm-hmm. Welcome to Blandino's. Try the evening special, whole wheat pasta cardboard nera. Yeah, my mom made that. <laughs> At Blandino's, we skip the flavors and pass the savings on to you. At Blandino's, the head chef is Chris Carolla. <laughs> oh, oh wow. I love that one. one. Blandino's signature cocktail, the Nona. Muddled Totino's pizza roll. One part watered down fortified wine. Two parts the tears of a crestfallen Italian grandmother. Slightly jostled. Served <laughs> over room temp plastic <laughs> ice cubes. <laughs> <laughs> Very specific. Got your own offerings, Here, Dawson? Here's mine. All right. At Blandino's, our Italian dressing is actually an Armenian cook who hasn't put his shirt on yet. Italian <laughs> dressing. Into a more classic flavor? Try our vinegar and oil salad dressing, now with 100% vinegar. It's <laughs> <laughs> no oil. Blandino's, how mama microwaves. <laughs> All of our peppers come from a shaker. The lack of flavor will send you into fits when you try our signature seizure salad. Oh, good taste. Just released from prison, remember the taste of home at Blandino's. Nice. Try our braided rope pasta, now made with real braided rope. (laughs) Al dente isn't just the tenderness of pasta, it's also our dishwasher's name. (laughs) Like leftovers? That's all we serve at Blandino's. And finally, Blandino's will have you saying, Questo cibo fascifo. In English, this food sucks. (laughs) Nice.
<laughs> nice offerings, Dawson. <laughs> Seizure set. The comedy chops. All right, Vinny Tortorich is uh, waiting. We'll get into uh, all his uh, latest doc, which I watched uh, last night. First, I'll tell you about Simply Safe. Want your home to feel safer? No better time than now. This week, our friends at Simply Safe are giving Adam Carolla Show listeners access to their holiday deals 40% off, everyone. This is a great company to make a great product. It's uh, wireless, but the batteries last up to 10 years. It, it, the stuff is small, it's compact, it's ergonomic, it looks good, peel and stick. Don't have to drill holes or pull wires, hard wire stuff in there. Name best home security system of 2021 by U.S. News and World Report. Customize a system for your home online in just minutes. Even get free custom recommendations. Simply Safe's biggest discount of the year. Get a system starting at just over 100 bucks. No long-term contracts or commitments. Supplies are limited. Take that 40% off at simplysafe.com slash Adam today. Vinny Tortorich at it again, Beyond Impossible. You can pre-order it now on Apple iTunes, available nationwide January 11th. Good to see you again, my friend. Thank you, guys, uh, for having me on. By the way, uh, um, I, I started to get the hang of this Blandino thing. May I try one? I just have one here. I jotted down. <laughs> All right. Everyone's okay. getting into the act. By the way, shouldn't Chet Waterhouse be doing this? Aren't you guys just taking his idea and... Not bland enough. And, yeah, and, you're right. Oh, not, all, right. all right. Let me try this. Oh, I got music and everything. You ready? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Blandino's Amish Italian restaurant. <laughs> when you're here, you're fucked. <laughs> Funny, but I don't know about the, <laughs> putting, the, putting the profanity up on the, on the sign, but... Yeah, it won't we focus group well. Google. They won't know what it means. You, know, you oh, can just Google. change it a little bit. It's an online yeah. ad. Uh, <laughs> so congratulations on the latest doc, Beyond Impossible. We're talking about the Impossible Burger and all the Beyond meat, Beef. Beyond and all the uh, all the things that we're trying to now substitute. Uh, and it's obviously we've talked about it a long time. Like it is, it is sort of turned into a religion and that's kind of the new world order that everything has to take on more than what it, what it just is. So, um, Vinny, let's first talk about, I was talking about India and cows and methane. Could you give us a little, little breakdown on, on that and methane? And that seems to be one of the big complaints about beef is the methane. Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, uh, methane, uh, has, um, uh, 10 years and it's all regenerative and you know methane from any animal does not stay in the atmosphere forever you know when you know yes i'm not i'm not some kind of denier of whatever it is this week right so i'm not denying that we have climate change problems or anything else all i try to do is get down to the truth and when you get people like dr mitlerner and all these these bright minds from around the planet and they'll go well Cows and ruminants have never been the problem um, because that methane goes into the atmosphere and is chewed up within, you know, a few years. Unlike when you belch something from a car or from a factory or anywhere else, that can stay in the atmosphere. That's adding to it for thousands of years. You know, that, that's where the CO2 problem comes from. It's never been animals. It's never been cows. Uh, even, you know, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, when we had a lot more, you know, um, bison in this country, um, we didn't have anywhere near the We had more ruminants in this country and, and there was no problem with CO2. We, we weren't burning up the atmosphere. But when you look at where all of like I'm not making this number up, 90 percent of all methane coming from ruminants is coming from India. Right. What's and this the is definition a of that, a ruminant? Uh, uh, basically, an animal that that uh, uh, ruminates, who eats uh, eats from the land, you know. And uh, but, you know, uh, uh, we're talking cattle. We're talking deer. A deer is a ruminant, right? They're eating vegetation. They're mm -hmm. they're putting methane out into the, the atmosphere. That's a simple definition of what they are. Cud uh, chewing animals. Cud chewing. Yeah, okay. yeah, pretty much. Um, 
Which also proves, you know, you need a couple of stomachs in most cases to make this work. <laughs> and yet they're telling humans to do this. But that's a different story for a different day. 90% of all of the, the gases coming from, from these ruminants are coming from India because we're talking about, you know, a large portion of India won't eat cattle. They're sacred. If a cow walks into your house, you just let it walk right through, right? Literally, if it walks into your house, your house is blessed by God or something. I've been to that country. It doesn't seem like many people are blessed by God. Um, but that's where the problem is, right? Uh, yet, you know, the country that's not killing cattle is putting most of the gas, which, again, is still not the problem. I just want to make that very clear. What is a, where are we at in terms of market share? these days with the impossible burgers and the beyond meat and all that kind of stuff. You know, we've, we've, we're hearing about fast food chains all picking it up and having a offering. Um, but where, where's this going and, and sort of where are we at now? Like, you know, it's gotta be tiny, right? It seems tiny, but like also seems like it's traction. growing yeah. every, every 10 minutes. Every right? fast food place has a choice for it. Right. Um, it's, it's got a very minuscule market share, but it is growing. They're dropping billions of dollars into this. When I say they, this includes the meat companies like Cargill and Tyson and all of these big meat corporations are, you know, they see which way the wind's blowing. So they're dropping, in some cases, a half a billion or a billion dollars into this. The good news from my side of the street, where I think this stuff should never be served to any human being or any animal for that matter is that the stock is starting to tank. You know, people are looking at this going, number one, it's too expensive. Number two, it's not really meat. Number three, it tastes like crap, right? In most cases, it doesn't taste so good. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's losing some of its market share uh, as we speak. And I'm hoping that this film can become the death knell of, of that whole industry. Although um, I'm not holding my breath for that. They're going to keep trying in different ways. Brian. The taste like crap part, of course, is, you know, subjective. But the bar for like if you're McDonald's and like there's an impossible burger on the menu or whatever they're calling it. And they're whatever burger. The bar isn't that high to cross to get better. Like you're talking about like a high end burger, like a you know a whatever place. Yeah, that's gonna that's gonna taste better. But for the McDonald's cardboard burger, how low is the bar to get across just for that to taste acceptably? Well, and like Vinny said before, even just about the McDonald's burger patty, you have it on its own, and you're like, Goo, but you add the oh, the, the, the geschmack, the yeah, the yeah. cheese. Then now you now you have a burger that you can eat. That's right. And to add to that, let's put taste aside. Um, there's nothing healthy about a fast food hamburger. You know, the bun is crap. You're putting all the goop on it, the ketchup, the special sauce and flavorings and all that. So you have nothing but uh, seed oils and, and high fructose corn syrup and everything else. And even though the meat was a low quality meat, it was the only healthy thing that was in that burger. Mm. But by doing this, you're now pulling that out and you know, weaponizing something that was already weaponized, if that's even possible, but that's what they're doing. Is this a, a decent analogy? Because um, I think we think of that category as sort of the, the do-gooders. We think of the big corporations as the big meat packing places and the chicken farms and everything. Yeah, the like factory farming. Factory sure. farm, that's bad. And then we look at this and we go, mm -hmm. well, that's good. But, you know, the analogy I was thinking about is like big tobacco. We don't like them, but they are getting into pot mm -hmm. and, oh, yeah. and, and, and other things course. as well. Mm -hmm. And we think of pot is good, but R.J. Reynolds is bad. But we don't realize that R.J. Reynolds is getting deep into, right. into pot. And it's kind of that way with this. You think of Tyson as the bad guys and the Impossible Burger as the good guys. But it's not the same guy. far apart. they may yeah. be the same guy. They're exactly the same guy. Um, look, there's nothing, you, you can't get me to agree on factory farming, you know, uh, when it comes to cattle and, uh, or, or any livestock. It's, it's bad news. And we have a long way to go in this country. And by this country, I mean the world to change that. And I really do think it can be changed. Um, looking at vegetation as being that change is the wrong thing to do. 
um, you're not saving little fuzzy animals at all. As a matter of fact, I'll make a case in the movie that you're actually killing more animals that you will never eat. Just by cracking land, you're killing animals, you're killing, you know, insects, you're killing worms, you're killing snakes, you're killing frogs. And when these combines, and I show this in a movie, when these combines are going through, they're not killing one rabbit or two rabbits or a couple of skunks. They're killing tens of thousands. They actually have to stop the machines every now and then and clear them of dead animals. Um, I don't know if you saw the whole movie, but these companies hire snipers to go out at night, these farmers. They hire snipers to go out at night and kill thousands of pounds of meat, of, of uh, hogs and, and deer and everything else that no one will ever eat. So if you think you're doing well by having tofurkey on Thanksgiving, think again. A lot had to die for you to have that piece of crap meal, right? And this is not getting it. And, uh, you know, the vegans are doing this whole deal where they're going, well, it's about killing with the intent of eating the animal versus the, and you know, just accidentally killing. No, it's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. Thing. Yeah, the, there's, uh, the, the, there's no difference. The, Vinny pulls from a TED talk where the guy says it's basically the difference between you kill a dog with your car, but one you accidentally didn't see on the road, and one you're just literally chasing down in the car. And then he says, "Okay, well, guess what? That's when you're talking about the GPS and the combines, and you don't realize that you're killing and digging up these animals. That there are snipers that have to go out because otherwise the crops are destroyed. Right? I saw that movie with Liam Neeson yeah. in it. <laughs> Liked it. Killing hogs. Yeah, yeah. particularly set of skills. Well. Did uh, Vinny? What's new in uh, the keto world and uh, your world? Uh, what's new for breakfast? What's uh, what's something we can eat? What's something we can drink? <laughs> Give us something. Give us something. The holidays are are up, up, upon us. You know what I was thinking about? I was thinking about you the other day. Uh, somebody ordered a quiche. Mm. Nice. And uh, okay. God damn, whew, don't sleep on quiche, oh, man. Right. Don't. Quiche is so goddamn good. It's covered with the bacony goodness yeah. and fluffy mm. eggs and everything. And I was thinking, man, this tastes good. And I think I can have, I can do a few bites as long as I don't do the crust. Oh, the crust very so thin good. crust yeah. at the, at the bottom, flaky. at least. Maybe stay away from the edge. But then I thought, this tastes too good. Is it firmed <laughs> up with flour? What is in this? And what's quiche? And then I started thinking, could you do this quiche in a cauliflower type pan crust? And would that would that work? Uh, thoughts on quiche. And by the way, you know, when I was young, the biggest selling book of 1977 was Real Men Don't Real Eat, men don't quiche. eat so. quiche. And I'm like, who wouldn't? First off, it's a pie yeah. made of bacon yeah, breakfast uh, and pie. ham. I, who the? I'm all dude and I'm all quiche. <laughs> what like, moron? I know it sounded yeah, and, good at the time. Do you guys remember that yeah, book? Yeah, I remember I hearing that it like, exists. I remember being a punchline yeah. like in sitcoms. It was like the biggest selling mm. book of 1977 or something. <laughs> but quiche, Vinny. Quiche is fine. Here's the oh. deal. You, of course, you have the uh, you have the pastry on the bottom, and uh, if you want to be real keto, uh, don't eat that. But you see, no one's ever gotten fat from eating like that. Quiche is mostly um, uh, cream and eggs and and all the goodness that you should be eating. When we were eating quiche back when that book was out, we didn't have a a, a problem yet because we weren't metabolically broken as a people. Now we're metabolically broken. So if you're that broken, yeah, quiche is off of your table. Adam, you're not you, you're not 400 pounds. You don't have type 2 diabetes. You don't have A1Cs of 12. So if you ate a piece of quiche, you're fine, right? Goddamn, I'm getting quiche <laughs> as soon as we sign yeah, off. But listen, I mean, that doesn't mean Vinny says I can have quiche, therefore bring on the quiche three times a day. Well, I will I will say this about at least the last quiche mm. I experienced, which again, goddamn delectable. Wonderful. The um the crust at the bottom is wafer thin. I was it's gonna... it's it's less it's it's three thirty seconds. I mean yeah. it's it's an eighth of an inch, maybe, and it's just soaked with 
oils and quiche goodness, Butter. you know. I don't want to rob you of your quiche experience, so why not just go uh, crustless and get a frittata? Yeah, what I was going to say hmm. was exactly that. Do it in a skillet where everything kind of crisps up nice with no crust and overcook it just a scum. Well, I was, I was, and then was you'll get that place. nice bottom. I was somewhere. Oh, I don't yeah. know if they had that as an offer, but I, I reckon if you... St- Stayed away from the thicker edge crust. Yeah, could, yeah and of just course. Stuck with the bottom. Well, Vinny would You'll know. be fine. Vinny would uh, <laughs> yeah, look no, the other um, way. Yeah, you, you just have to look when you're looking for something to have, and you know, quiche is not something you're going to have every day. So I, I say enjoy. You know, my, you my know whole Adam. thing is. Yeah, we, we do know Adam. Well, listen, can um, I say this about quiche? Uh, keep the zucchini and the fucking broccoli mm-hmm. out of it. Well, why are we adding flavorless items that are Onions, soaked with water? Onions, peppers, maybe mushrooms. Bacon, cheese. Bacon and ham are good to go. Yeah. Bacon, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who's, uh, Chris, you no, got a question? Right Sorry. Person. Sorry, Chris, I yeah, think there's a question. Um, and this, this is kind of on the other side of the spectrum, but there's this guy on Instagram, Vinny, named Liver King. And I've seen a lot <laughs> oh, of people. Oh, yeah. Oh, he's fall, so gross. Yeah. And he just eats, uh, he eats a lot of like raw liver, raw Ew. testicles. It's, it's horrible. Raw organ meats and, and like Anthony bone Zimmer. marrow. And he swears it's transformed his life. And like I have friends like following this diet. And I'm just curious uh, what you think of it. Have you seen this guy, Vinny? Yeah, I have. People send it to me all the time. Um, I'm a guy, look, I grew up skinning animals and everything else. I personally, I, I hate liver. Yeah, you know, there is no, and, and if someone's going to say, no, Vin, you got to have my liver, my mm-hmm. liver. You know what? I, you know, bottom line is I've seen the guy. I know what he's up to. All of that stuff is actually healthy for you, but I'm not eating balls and liver. <laughs> bottom line. It's just not going to happen. I'm, I'm, I'm with you, my brother. I, you know, when I was growing up, there were a few things I didn't like. Mm. Mushrooms mm-hmm. I, I wasn't Same. a fan Same. of. There's a few things I wasn't a fan of. And then there was liver. And I've gotten past all of mm. them. And even learned even to embrace, embrace beets, yeah. many, embrace many, many, many things, but I sh- never got with liver. Even with the Jews, which is the worst kind of do it, the chopped liver with the egg in it. <sighs> yeah. It's the saying, what am I, chopped liver? Exactly. Right. For Nobody sake. wants it. All right. Uh, let me give you a plug, Vinny. Beyond Impossible, the name of the doc. Congratulations on that. You can pre-order it now on Apple iTunes, available worldwide January 11th, and uh, you can follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Vinny Tortorich. Vinny, always great to see you, my friend. Great seeing you guys, and uh, if I don't talk to you guys, Merry Christmas, Happy yes. Holidays, whatever you have going on. Love you. Love you, Vinny. All right. I'm happy. This is a good, is a good, day. good quiche day for me because <laughs> I am... I've talked about uh, not eating enough egg salad. Mm. I don't eat enough quiche. Yeah. Now it's literally yeah. on the table. All right. Is anyone, what's a good crust uh, uh, that is keto crust? Does everything have to be cauliflower? For You mean for a breakfast, for a quiche or for yeah, in general? Yeah, for a quiche. Honestly, you're, this is going to be the worst, most unsatisfying answer. I'd skip the crust. You yeah. don't want to mix the cauliflower and the... Mm-hmm. I mean, you could do one of those yeah. sausage crusts, but yeah. I say save that for the pizza. Yeah. I'm with Gina. Uh, we, my, we make one in our family. It's called a froja. It's essentially a quiche. Mm-hmm. But you just put it in a casserole dish yeah. and, uh, and cook it enough. It'll get crispy on the outside and no crust. But I'm telling you, don't sleep on the skillet. That's where it'll crisp up in the oven. What year was Real Men Don't Eat Quiche? Who wrote that book? Why was it so goddamn popular? And... What was in it? Was it just a pure mm. comedy? Yeah, so it was published in 82, written by Bruce Fierstein. Hmm. Yeah, and it's a best-selling tongue-in-cheek book, satirizing stereotypes of masculinity. Nope. Ties have changed. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. All right, we'll take a quick break, come back with the news right after this. So not too long ago, we talked to Mitch Album, and among his many credits is he runs this orphanage in Port-au-Prince in Haiti, and it's, as we talked about with him, it's kind of crazy over there, for lack of a better word. Well, we're going to check in on Haiti because that violent Haitian gang that kidnapped those 17 members of that U.S. Christian missionary missionary group in October, they've released three hostages, at least three more. So five have now been released. still going on? Yes. By the 400 Mazawa gang. Where's Casey the vigilante? Yeah, Yeah, he should go over there. Which has threatened to kill everyone if their $17 million ransom isn't paid. 
Christian Aid Ministries says the released hostages are safe in good spirits. Uh, the U.S. continuing its efforts to secure the release of the remaining hostages. The group of missionaries included kids, and they were abducted while visiting an orphanage outside of Port-au-Prince which is why I was curious if anyone had ever bothered Mitch's, and thank God they haven't. Now, not clear if any of the kids have been released. They're not saying who among the group has been released, but there are kids in there. And I'm always amazed that here we are knocking on the door of 2022 and all these activities that seem thousands of years old mm-hmm. still still a place Going for strong. them in in this world in modern society yes then i'm always um i'm always kind of befuddled why we can't get this envoy of sane nations together and just go all right let's you know let's see what we can do right this, this, this is there we talk a lot about like human rights and human mm-hmm. rights atrocities and things like that and tra- trafficking and sex slaves and slavery and all this stuff that is still going on and then it's like well I get why we can't march into China mm-hmm. and break up one of their Uyghur factories over there uh, I, I I get the optics mm-hmm. of that but Haiti, yeah. Seems doable. Well, here's my jaded slash innocent uh, stop set. So first of all, I'm thinking nobody gives a shit about Haiti because there's no resources that we can mine. Mm-hmm. From what I'm aware of, there, there's no like crop that we need from Haiti. But also with Haiti being so super duper close to Puerto Rico and we have a vested interest in Puerto Rico, why wouldn't we just take care of the whole island? You know what I mean? I, know, I feel that way about Cuba. Like, they're just going strong, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, Fidel's gone, his brother's taken over, we can look forward to another 50 years of this, I... It, it it's just you know maybe I'm naive but it just seems like well it's not like Haiti's sitting on a a missile that they're going to launch at us it's 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 roving gangs right yeah it seems like you know I don't know a couple of uh, platoons of seals could go over there in a zodiac Straight raft things out pretty and quick. get yeah. things working again Be great but yet they don't even have a leader yeah it's 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 really it's really strange. And I guess it's always existed, but now the chasm keeps growing, you know, like we're, we're talking about space tourism and they're still abducting <laughs> kids, kids and, right. and, and take, taking them up into the hills right. and surviving off canned beans. You know, it's just, it's so, I guess, I guess it, it's too stark Like there's too big a chasm, you know, back in the day, it was sort of like, well, you know, there's this nation that's not, you know, uh, they they got they've enslaved a certain mm-hmm. amount of people, but eh, we got slavery over right. here. You know, what's their main tra- port? You know, their main transportation there? A horse. Same. Eh, we got a horse. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, our house is a little better, but we don't got running water, and they don't got running. Water. Now it's mm-hmm. it's crazed. Mm-hmm. We're the getting we're, it's we're going centuries. we're going into the space age right. here, and they're still where they were, and I think it's that chasm that's bumping me yeah and it's also this thing of like why can't technology fix things you know what i mean yeah. it can't fix human behavior yeah i think yeah, that's I found kind of the to bring problem us closer together right yes yeah i'm sitting here trying to think of answers as though this is going to be solved <laughs> mm-hmm. in the next three minutes but yes let's solve right. haiti right now that'd be great um Oh, so let's talk about the Army <clears throat> and the military, because since 1980, the U.S. Army fitness test has been simple. All it was, apparently, according to NBC News, consisted of two minutes of sit-ups, two minutes of push-ups, and a two-mile run. That has changed. So the new U.S. Army fitness test requirements are uh, deadlifting three reps of 140 pounds, Standing power throw, which is throwing a 10-pound medicine ball a distance of about 15 feet. Wait, so this got harder? Yeah. Oh, that's... I thought that was like, we'll take anybody. Same. Uh, Hand release push-up. Two minutes of these special push-ups, and I I don't know what they are. for everyone who's going in the Army? This just says this is their updated requirement. I feel like we just need to go, look, certain... Groups of these people are just going to stay stateside and work say. drones Desks. with a joystick. They're going to translate. They're going to pilot drones. Right. We don't. We don't. We don't need you guys away. to do anything. <laughs> you just got to have that. You know. Don't joyst- have carpal tunnel. Yeah. Joystick wrist has right. to be top shape. But 
then the other guys are going to be putting on the 50 pound rucksack go for and, it and yep. going going and fleshing al qaeda out of a cave that's right we they should do the sled audio. they do sled dogs mm-hmm. you carry these giant medicine balls and just start running and sprinting mm-hmm. these are all new requirements plank with leg trucks and the two mile run but that needs to be completed in under 21 minutes after. where are you at where are we at with women in combat we like it. Well, it's like we talked about with the fire department. Like, if you can yeah, do it, can you do pass it. the test, you pass the test. Mm-hmm. More, more hands on deck. All right. Don't you think? Yeah, I, I do. <laughs> I mean, if you can do it, you can do it. I'm fine with it. Yeah. yeah I you got to have that one. You have to have a standard. And if you're up to the standard, then you're up to it. Yeah. And, and it, we've established, especially through watching a lot of videos online, women are a lot more aggressive, <laughs> a lot meaner. Yeah. You know, Trigger finger's a little happier. They run into the enemy, especially if they have hair extensions. That's oh, right. They're going right after That's them. That's true. Yeah. yeah. I've mm-hmm. been there. Uh, new research suggests that Viagra is associated with dramatically reducing Alzheimer's. Mm. Now, it's not... Oh, is it a blood flow thing? Well, th- unclear. Okay. It's not... They're not saying, you know, this is a total... You know, this is the causation. But according to a study led by researchers at Cleveland Clinic, taking sildenafil, which is Viagra, is tied to a nearly 70% lower risk of developing Alzheimer's compared to non-users. Oh. That's based on an analysis of health insurance claims. This is the data. So from over 7.2 million people... Don't you think the real benefit is being in your 60s and trying to effectively bang 28-year-olds? Keep you sharp. Yeah. You gotta yeah. keep up Keep the conversation. Right. You can't, gotta watch YouTube. Yes. You can't sit there and go, hey, Kardashians. I don't know. What is uh, that? Is you that mean a from se- Star Trek? Is that a seasoning? <laughs> I don't know what that is. Mrs. You gotta, Kardashian? You gotta be sharp. Oh, yeah. Jay Z. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I What's know all Pete the Davidson lyrics. Up to these days, yeah, right? man. That guy's my bro. That's smart because And then you're yeah. just banging all the time, right. which kind of keeps you. Keeps, Young. keeps you oiled. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, the Maybe research. It's that. Yeah, they're not drawing a direct link, but they're saying they are, this is the correlation, and we're just seeing it as, with these insurance claims. Well, I think it opens blood vessels up right. or something. Because didn't so, they say it also helps your sinuses because it constricts, you know, and it lets more air flow through? Well, I guess I've heard that. But now we found out that everything has some sort of other effect. Right. And um, I like that everyone's working on Alzheimer's, though. Seriously. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really scary. Nice, because... Um, You're getting up there. Yeah, I'm getting up there. And you also, man, you know, it sounds sounds corny, but... You, you're so everyone's sort of, sort of focused on what they look like in their underwear, and oh, I got my back hurts or something like that. When your brain starts going, it's uh, yeah. makes everything pretty difficult. I I don't have anyone directly in my family that I've known with Alzheimer's or dementia, but I when I think about it, I can't think of anything scarier. Like your mind is going, y- mm. you are convinced that everybody around you is either not who they say they are, out to get you in some way, or you just don't know who you are or where you are or who these people are. That's I, terrifying. I, I, what happened to Philip the juggler was just he was just completely ravaged oh, by this and destroyed by it and just immediately just eaten up. Like it is, you could not w- wish something worse on your worst enemy than that. And he had rapid onset mm-hmm. and early, but it is, it's, a, how would you function? I mean, I, I do think about it like, uh, you know, I look at my schedule in the morning or in the evening. And it's like I got to do the Zoom call at whatever, and I got to do this hit over here, and then I'm going to do Anne Hayes after that, and I got to do a Beyond a Reasonable Doubt after the whatever. And I, I just sort of look at it, and I was actually thinking about it. Like, I was dropping Natalia off at school and then going, okay, I can go home for an hour, but then I got to do this, and then we got to do this writing session for this other project. And I was like, well, thank God I, I know all this yeah, stuff. Right. Like, I don't have to keep wondering right. where I'm going or looking down. Not or sure. it's, a, it's a thing. But I, I do also think, like they said, like doing the crossword puzzles, keeping it worked mm-hmm. out. Man, I mean, Shatner is 90, 91. <laughs> Sharp is a goddamn tact. And I realize he just gets up and exercises his brain every single day. It's amazing. Here's a morbid thought, but we're on the topic. So I might as well ask, hypothetical, for you and you only, would you rather uh, have Alzheimer's or some sort of dementia like that or ALS, which is the opposite, where you have that perfectly clear mind, but you're trapped inside of a mm-hmm. tomb of a body? Funny you should ask, because that's 
pretty much what happened to my dad. And mm. I constantly thought, like, what's worse, knowing exactly what's going on and not being able to move any part of your body or speak or being relatively physically healthy but not knowing where you are or who these people are. And uh, it's a pick your poison. Obviously. I was going to say, I don't know if we're allowed to take a pass. No, but some but and, and I'm saying what what I witnessed was a fucking living nightmare. I still think. I would rather have that than not know who I am or who the people are around me. Interesting. Just be totally alone. Well, certainly today. Go back 200 years, you know, maybe not. But now well, right. you have your phone, your computer, your plasma TV set. You know, you can handicap ramps and devices. Oh, sure. And you can't touch them. You can things. blink out messages, you know, through an you eye can, gaze. Yeah, breathe through Sorry, a straw I, and make I've your... experience with uh, ALS and you, you can't touch anything. Your hands are immobile. Yeah. Yeah, well, all I know is the episode of Love Boat where Barbie Jesus. Benton's That's boyfriend right. got, got ALS on the was diagnosed by Doc on the ship. Gleefully but, so announced. So that's all I know. But So ALS, because then you get to go on a cruise. I, I would still rather, I'm just saying, I would rather keep my mind, and I'm bringing up technology just because we use less and less mm -hmm. of our bodies, you know, mm -hmm. back before there were handicapped vans sure, right. and electric wheelchairs and all the accessible stuff. I, I'll take my mind for as long as I can. Yeah, the singularity is coming anyway, so that's really all we need. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, this story is tailor-made for Adam Carolla around the holidays. Um, there's this Griswold Christmas house display. It's in La Mirada, California. Mm -hmm. And it's this annual attraction based on the movie, you know, based on Christmas Vacation. Everybody loves it. People come from everywhere to look at it. It's really fun. Um, every year, the guy who runs it, like, does a different detail. This year, he has the trailer out front. He has, like, a, a, oh, Eddie, a moving mannequin with Cousin Eddie, you mm -hmm. know, saluting with a beer. He has the whole deal. But he is in trouble because La, the city of La Mirada is pissed because he added a fake, it, not not real, a fake second story. So the house looks just like the Griswold house mm -hmm. and the permit patrol have come out to play. Mm -hmm. so, is it inflatable? Fo no, it's just like a, like a facade. Okay. Uh, Fox LA reports that the homeowner, Jeff Norton, decided to add this makeshift second story uh, so the home looks just like the movie, but Norton didn't apply for building permits, so therefore the addition hasn't been inspected, and they say it could be a safety hazard. So city officials gave Norton a December 6th, which we've passed, deadline to take Do the structure down. Do we have pictures down. of it? I'm going to show you it to you right now. He hasn't done that. Here's a 40-second clip of Norton talking to Fox LA about how he's not bowing to the city. I'm thinking for sure the city of La Mirada, with as much revenue as I bring them and every every smile in the world, it, it, they're going to help me out here. And she wasn't helping me at all. She was exactly the exact opposite of that. She's like, you know what? Take it down. That's our only remedy. Or pay the fines. $100 the first week. It'll be $100 the second week. It'll be $500 the third week and $500 the fourth week. Fines he says he's willing to pay to keep the second story intact and continue his annual holiday tradition another year. There's so many people that laugh, cry, come to this display. I mean, it, it's it's a, a part of people's Christmas now. Do people you know, cry? we're not going to be doing that. There's <laughs> Well, they get the suds in their eyes. Yeah, yeah. they will. They will tear yeah, up. Good point. He could have left out crying. Oh, leave him alone. Jesus Christ! City. And he even said, that "I am generating revenue. People come. They'll grab a bite to eat. They'll park. They're whatever. I'm generating revenue. Just leave me alone." Yeah, the thing about the city and or the neighbors when you're doing things that are of a positive nature, like, hey, I'm I'm expanding my tax base or I'm <laughs> fixing up the, the I'm going to bring up all the comps in the yeah. neighborhood because you were living next mm -hmm. to a rat infested dump. And I'm I'm putting 400 grand. Mm -hmm. as well. They don't give two shits about any of the positive anything that you may be doing over there, city or or neighbors. And um well, you guys have heard my feelings on the building inspectors and, mm -hmm. and how that goes. It's, so. it's always so. a it's always it's always a shit show. But I don't know why, but I'm I've never said it on the air. But um, La Mirada, the city of La mm -hmm. Mirada, I, I always hear that Bruce Springsteen song. I'm a rocker in my head. I don't even know what that one's called. Is that I'm a rocker by Bruce I don't even Springsteen? Know that one. Oh, you will when you, oh. when are we, I don't know what it's called, but if you sing La Mirada, baby, La Mirada, <laughs> it'll all, it'll all make sense. for a rocker. For Jackson a rocker? Is that? Nah, this I'm is a rocker. It, yeah, I'm a rocker. Yeah. 
Huh? Boy, do you guys not know Bruce Springsteen? 1980. I, Bruce off, Springsteen. off the river. I'm, I'm just a, looking at. I'm it was a big hit. Living La Mirada. Oh. All right. <laughs> Cut you off. That's the song. <laughs> That's fine. All right. Am I the only one who knows this song? Yes. I'm vaguely familiar with it, but I couldn't. Mm. No. Felt like I heard on I used to hear it a lot. Hey, how about that uh, horse Christmas show? You guys all down with that? Or is a it horse another, is a Christmas show? Am I out on an island again? But, ba- baby, I'm a rocker. My horse show. My Cavalera show. <laughs> Or whatever Cavalia. it was. Cavalia. I'm so glad you said that because the horse trainer that I uh, got in touch with wrote back, and I forgot to tell you. Oh, about you, how they kill the horses yeah, at the track? Yeah, and why and all that stuff. Her name's Mindy Brogdon, and she's a horse trainer in Arizona. She's like a horse uh, re- rehabilitation. She does everything. And she wrote me because she was listening to the show, and she said... Um, uh, you know, she was putting a horse down as we speak. Okay. Um, she said, think about immobilizing a thousand pounds. Surgery on this horse is a minimum of $10,000 with a 50% lesser survival rate. And then she says, their size and need to be on their feet is the biggest challenge. All the systems are built on standing. Hard to overcome that with a major rehab surgery. Um, the vet does it. They rarely use guns. It's lethal injection. But she might be talking about off the track. Somebody told me they give him the bolt. Yeah, the, she said, uh, no country for old right. men. Ball. Oh, guns are used stunner. in specific. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Ugh. So I'm there a you rocker, go. Never released as a single. Never released as a single. There were six singles off the river. That was not one of them. What were all the? Uh, I guess they played it on KLOS out here or something back in the seven back singles, in the day. including "Hungry Hearts" and uh, "The River." Of course, Cadillac Ranch. As long as we if Ugh. they open Cavalia with "I'm a Rocker," you do <laughs> lots. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess uh, whatever station I used to listen to, it wouldn't have been a K-Rock song, but K-L-O-S. it would have been like a KLOS, yeah. KMET, if they were still oh, around. Yeah. 1980? Yeah, KMET was still around, so. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. All right, let's bring it home because we got uh, Kathy Ireland going to join me in a minute. got it. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. Gina, Gina Grad! That was the news with Gina Grad. Grad! La Mirada, live in La Mirada. I don't know what I, when I was young, I just would have to modify every song in my head to be something else. It was uh, loosely based on my early exposure to the jingle bells and the Batman smells, smells, and I would just have to modify everything in my head. All right, let me tell you about uh, Trico. Over one century ago, Trico was first to make wiper blades. They've been a step ahead of Mother Nature ever since. Trico engineers study your specific driving conditions and make sure you're ready for anything out there. I don't care if it's raining, sleet, snow, and uh, some of you folks living in parts of the country where it's getting into the winter weather, this is a safety issue. You need good wiper blades. Man, if you can't see where you're going, that's an issue. Snowing at night, dark country roads, whatever the weather, Trico wipers maintain maximum windshield contact. No matter what your driving habits, you'll always find the right wiper blade for your vehicle. Trico has been the future wiper blade since 1917. Man, they've been at it for a long time. I think they know what they're doing. So if you want to find a store near you or a place that's fine, find out what's going on with Trico and all their various products, you go to TricoCatsAndDogs.com. That is TricoCatsAndDogs.com. All right. We'll take a little break. We'll come back with a one-on-one with the beauty mogul. Kathy Ireland, right after this. The Adam Carolla Show presents Kathy Ireland's birthday cocktail party for March 20th. Let's see who's invited. We welcome actor, comedian, writer, and director, the legendary Carl Reiner. American psychologist, B.F. Skinner. Popular British singer, does anybody here remember? Vera Lynn. Breaker, breaker. American country music singer and actor, the snowman, Jerry Reed. NBA coach, Pat Riley has joined the party. Hockey Hall of Famer, Bobby Orr. Actor, William Hurt. Stevie Ray's big brother, guitarist from the Fab T-Birds, Jimmy Vaughn. Spike Lee has joined the party. Holly Hunter is here. From Reno 911, Cedric Yarbrough. 
And it is a wonderful day in the neighborhood. Fred Rogers is here. Kathy Ireland is on the Adam Carolla Show. Good to see you, my dear. Ah, uh, great to see you. Thank you. Kathy, uh, I've been uh, very intrigued with your uh, career. Of course, we all found out about Kathy through modeling and Sports Illustrated Edition, Swimsuit Edition, and all the like, but uh, later on became quite the mogul, and I'm very interested in uh, that story. So uh, let's talk about it. And by the way, the album is called uh, Blackbird, Lennon, McCartney, Icons by Billy Davis Jr. and Marilyn McCartney. And it's uh, released on Kathy's new uh, record label. And uh, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the uh, Walton's movie, which is coming back as well. But I know you're not here really to plug anything, just here to have a conversation. So thanks for joining me. Thank you. So uh, I know you grew up in uh, Santa Barbara. Uh, I grew up in California myself. Um, Sounds like a pretty sane place to grow up in. Uh, always seem to have the entrepreneurial spirit because I heard the story about you being a paper girl, I think the first one in your area when you're about eight years old. But then an incident happened. So I want to kind of talk about that. Can you discuss that story? Well, let's see. Many incidents happened. Um, are you referring to during the paper route days? Yeah, when uh, the fellow wanted to know why a girl was doing a boy's job. So, so when, when I was growing up, um, I just, I was dreaming of having a paper route. I I was, you know, that kid that was going door to door selling things that I know, Adam, you uh, are very entrepreneurial as a kid yourself. And uh, when I finally came of age, my dad shows me this article in our local newspaper that said newspaper carrier wanted are you the boy for the job and I I know dad did that to get a reaction out of me and I wrote a letter to the newspaper I said I'm not the boy I'm the girl I can do this just as well as any boy and the first day the papers were really really thick and I was a really scrawny kid and I couldn't even lift a sack I had to crawl under (laughs) on my belly and try to to carry you know all the papers I'd get rid of the papers in the front of the sack and the weight would choke me back anyway it was it, it was a, a good challenge. And I'm pedal the first day I'm pedaling up the hill and I noticed this man, he's standing at the end of his driveway, looks super agitated, his face is all red, and I hand him his paper and he starts yelling at me and he says, This is a boy's job. You have no business being here. You're never gonna last. And I mean it was really harsh, but I, I mean I gotta say I'm I'm grateful to this day because there were a lot of days when I felt like quitting, but there was no way I was going to let that man uh, stop me from my dream. And my dad always said, you know, Kathy, give 110%. If the customer expects the paper on the driveway, you put it on the front porch. And it's the foundation of our business today. And it's, uh, you know, when a team member does a, a great job, we say you got it on the front porch. Oh, that's interesting. Is, um, so what did you think you were going to be doing when you were a young person growing up in Santa Barbara? I mean, I imagine a lot of women dream of modeling and stardom and that kind of stuff, but it didn't seem like that was the kind of family you came from. What was what were the thoughts when you were younger? You know what, Adam? Um, really grateful. My parents raised my sisters and I to really not have limits, and so you know, really grew up believing, thinking we could do anything. And my mom was the ultimate entrepreneur; she still is. Um, I mean, everything from babysitting jobs to house cleaning business to designing her own, you know, making dresses, sewing dresses, sewing them at art fairs. I'd make jewelry and handbags to go along with it. She was an Avon lady um, and then went to school to become a nurse, ultimate entrepreneur. My dad, when I was born, he was selling paint in Los Angeles and stuff wasn't really good that was happening at work. And He contacted his union. They offered him a job up in Santa Barbara. So I grew up um, with experiencing my dad working with Cesar Chavez that, you know, when you're driving 
from LA to Santa Barbara and you go through Oxnard and Camarillo and you see all the farms. He was always pointing out the people bending down and as a result of not having the longer hose, but the shorter ones, because that was cheaper, give them better profit margins. And there were no outhouses. There were no places for people to relieve themselves with dignity. So dad fought to make those changes. So I I really grew up with pretty amazing parents recognizing that there's going to be battles. You got to fight, but you just fight through them and you believe in what you're doing and uh, you persevere. Cesar Chavez is obviously famed farm labor leader. I'm old enough to remember a grape boycott that he may have put on back. We're similar ages. Uh, There was a big don't buy grapes. You know, my mom never had. Were you not allowed to eat grapes, too? Well, my mom was very civically minded, but super lazy at the same time. So you couldn't get her to volunteer at the soup kitchen, but you could get her not to eat something that was kind of expensive already. So it's not like we're like an Italian family that uh, made, you know, subsisted off of grapes anyway. But I remember I have this distinct memory of being, you know, eight years old and her going, we're not eating grapes. There's a great boycott. Cesar Chavez is, is, is planned this boycott. And uh, I don't know, un, uh, uh, un, you know, scab workers were coming in to pick the grapes. I don't, I don't remember all the official particulars because I was eight and I wasn't living it like, like you were. But your dad in that relationship in that time, that's a very interesting time. What, what? It was an interesting tell time. Tell me more about mm-hmm. what he did with Cesar Chavez. I mean, I, I was little, you know, but I, I remember being at rallies. I remember not eating grapes. Uh, Dad would take us on trips to Tijuana quite a bit. And um, he'd point out to us the homes that were literally made out of cardboard. And so as a little girl, I grew up thinking we were so rich. I mean, I mean, and we we were not without um that's not how I wouldn't define us as, as wealthy by most terms, but you know, we always had a roof over our head, food and, and everything. But I truly thought we were so wealthy and rich. I was almost embarrassed um, to tell people what, you know, my dad did for a living. Cause when he'd say the prayer at dinner time, he'd always say, you know, God, thank you for making me the richest man in the world. And I, I'm grateful to have that perspective. You know, it's when, um, when we get to experience how the majority of the world lives, it, it gives you a, a great appreciation and, uh, you know, respect for the things that we have. When, ha- so when did the modeling kick in? How did it start? Were you discovered quote unquote, and how did that begin? Yeah, that was, um, that was a surprise for me. It was never, part of my plan, but I grew up at a time where the look of the moment was changing because I didn't grow up. It wasn't like I was model material growing up. It was like this gangly kid with one eyebrow. And, um, but then that started to get a little bit popular. So, um, thank you, Brooke Shields, but, um, yeah, a scout asked if I wanted to go to New York for the summer. And my first response was no, thank you because it just didn't sound like fun. Um, it, it, it just didn't sound like something that I wanted to do. Or it didn't seem like a possibility. They said they'd advance us the money to go. So I checked it out. I figured if I didn't explore it, I you know I might regret it and I could save some money to go to college or to start a business And the reason that the modeling career lasted as long as it did, the entire time I was working in that industry, I was trying and failing at businesses. So if something had taken off sooner, um, I don't think that career would have gone on as long as it did. Yet, I'm grateful. There were a lot of lessons I learned from it, opened my eyes to the world, to, you know, the best designers in the world, people of all different cultures. So it it was a good education. How old were you when you began? I was 17 when I went for the summer and I stayed in a model's apartment. My mom came out with me and parents were super nervous. Um, And it was an eye-opening experience. It was 
I met some great people and I met some really awful, creepy people too. And I went there pretty naive, just thinking that all adults were going to be good people like my parents. And I quickly learned that they're not, uh, it, you know, I just, I, I had an incident that first summer where I had to uh, escape and I was grateful that I, that I got away, but I learned all these stories from other girls who weren't so fortunate and, uh, it's let, you know, it, it's really left an impact when parents approach me and they say, Hey, my son, my daughter wants to model. I, you know, I'm the one <laughs> being really cautious and just trying to trying not to be a killjoy, but also letting them know the realities of what's out there and what can happen. You got to be alert to it. Well, it seems like you were well suited for it because you had a base, you know, you had a strong father, strong mother, religion, work ethic. I mean, you had a good base to then go out into that world, which can be scary and, and navigate it. You know, I feel like a lot of the people that don't have the base of broken families, sometimes abuse and other things of that nature, mm -hmm. they don't have that base. And it's probably the, the same thing that can get them into addiction in that world as well. Because I just feel like when you have that broken base and then you're pushed out sort of prematurely into this adult world, that's when all the bad stuff happens. And I feel like just knowing what little I know about you, that your base probably prevent, you know, it's probably what made you fight back when somebody was trying to take advantage of you. Uh, whereas others who may have been victimized at a younger age may not have had that ability. But I am interested in hearing uh, you know, what that story is. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, Adam, what you what you said is absolutely correct. And that summer that I went there, I was 17. I was one of the older girls. I mean, there were girls 13, 14 years old. And uh, when I had the, this um, one issue in particular with a photographer, and I went and told my agent about it, and I just said, hey, I, I got away, but what about these young girls? And I, some of my roommates even, they didn't want to return home without feeling like they had made it. And so there's predators out there and they prey upon that. And you're right. You talk about a base and most people don't have that. And it can be very confusing and difficult. And I didn't know the word for it at the time. But I mean, there was sexual trafficking with girls. And it's something that's really alerted me now as a business person the importance of having that heightened alertness and awareness because uh, human trafficking is the fastest growing illegal business on earth. And unlike drugs, human beings can be sold over and over and over. And when people are no longer profitable in the sex slave trade, they're often sold into forced labor, which is why we've got to be so mindful of what's going on. And when we started our brand in 93 with a pair of socks, we began by doing surprise factory inspections because anybody can clean up if they know you're coming. Mm -hmm. But uh, you learn a lot when you show up unexpectedly. Yeah, you know, I was just thinking kind of philosophically about modeling and about some of these horror stories you hear and so many people taken advantage of and so on and so forth. So it strikes me that other professions that are sought after and, you know, respected and, you know, esteemed by our society and things like that. <clears throat> you know, if you're going to go into finance or banking or real commercial real estate, you get groomed for that job. You come from a certain kind of family. They prepare you, you get training, education. And when you show up, you're kind of belong, you know, mm -hmm. modeling it, it's so random so often that people that come from all different places, all different backgrounds, broken bases, back to our, our original one, and they just show up and they're all in the same place. And, you know, you came from a good place that enabled you to s stave off a lot of the, the evils in that world. But so many people that come from different countries, they don't have any money. It's a total mess. And then they show up. 
and they're kind of ripe to be uh, to be picked as as victims. Yeah, no, mo- most definitely. Um, you know, and I see it with with girls, with boys. I mean, you know, how was it for you when you were starting in in, in modeling work? back in the day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I I had a I had a base that was a little different than yours. I mean, family wasn't quite as supportive. Uh, I was able to find myself in. By the time I got into show business, I was thirty, so I didn't have any of that traveling young teen boy, you know, taken advantage of by unscrupulous uh, managers or agents or anything. I. I just work construction my entire life and uh, we'll talk decor and we'll talk flooring and we'll talk building. Cause uh, I built, I built custom closets. I worked at a Euro uh, cabinet shop. I've worked at American uh, standard cabinet shop. I built cabinets. I built entertainment units. I, I built kitchens. I did flooring. I did drywall. I did all the, all the interior stuff, all the finished stuff, base case crown, hung doors for a living. I mean, all of that was my background and I have a great love for it as well, even though I didn't really love it that much when I was doing it for a living. Cause that life is go to someone's nice house, hang some solid core Oak doors, and then go back to your crappy apartment with your three roommates in North Hollywood with the hollow core doors. But, uh, I never really had to experience anything cause I'm a dude and I wasn't exceptionally good looking and I was completely humbled by the world. I just got out of high school and started digging ditches and never had to worry about anyone who no one wanted anything for me. You know, there's a certain freedom, you know, you, you don't get preyed upon if you're not a very attractive target, you know, it's like, I don't know, poor people never get sued. <laughs> they don't have any money. So I never, I never experienced any, any of the, trappings or pitfalls that you might see in a, in a career that, that's, that becomes kind of the story in Hollywood. Yeah. Well, uh, what a, what a incredible background you have with building things and making things. Um, that's awesome. Well, I know that's part of what, part of what you do. And, but I guess my question is, is, you know, I was excited to talk to you about all this stuff because I'm so passionate about it. How much of that do you do? I mean, are, you know, when you're doing a remod, how hands-on are you? Are you looking at all the tile samples and the carpet swatches? Well, the, I mean, the home industry is one of the sectors in which we work and I work with an amazing team. And so for, for me, when, when I used to model, people would accuse me of being cheap that, you know, why don't you buy better clothes or drive a nicer car, whatever. But I prefer to think of it as fiscally frugal and I was investing in people. And so when we started our company, I put a a little team together and I love sports. I'm not particularly great at any of them. Um, Sense of adventure outweighs the grace, but I still love them. And I love the idea of getting people of all different backgrounds, different thoughts, different gifts, and bringing them together for a common goal. And, you know, an example is our genius uh, international creative director, um, John Carrasco. He's amazing. And so, and we have our in-house design team. So how hands on am I? I get accused of being a control freak. I prefer to think of it as passionate. And, uh, and I work with an amazing team of people. So very, very blessed for that. By the way, and don't... we've been together for, um, gosh, many of us, we've been together over 30 years now. And then we've got our millennials and our Gen Z's and it's, uh, but it's a, it's a wonderful, great group. And as I, as I get older, I recognize how rare it is to find really good people. So when you get great people, you just hang on to them. So, uh, back to the early days, you, you go, you get discovered, so to speak, you go to the modeling. Do they still have the modeling apartments where all the models live in New York? I don't know. I I don't know if they do, but, um, that, that was interesting. Yeah. We were in bunk beds and, um, and I was 
I'm, I'm, a, I'm a late bloomer. I was growing in height until I was 20. And so when I was 17, I had a metabolism. I could eat. And across the street, there was a Baskin Robin 31 flavors. And uh, one of my roommates would go get, um, it was called the earthquake. It was like the biggest hot fudge sundae you could get. And that was, um, you know, just little, little things that would bring a lot of joy at the end of a hard day. And so was it uh, by day going out, auditioning, going out and working? Give us- it was the go sees. Yeah. So you go, you'd get your, you know, that, that the booker would call you and tell you where to go and where to be. And you'd show them your pictures. So first you have to try to get people to take pictures of you. And then once you have enough pictures, you do your go sees. And I would say, Adam, the biggest gift of that career was all the rejection because when that started happening in business, it didn't destroy me. People would say, how can you, you know, that person was just so rude to you. How can you deal with that? Or they just slammed the door in your face. They just hung up on you. But it's like, well, I don't know, maybe they're in a bad mood or having a hard day or whatever that might be. But when you believe in what you're doing, someone else's opinion of you, it's not going to destroy you. And I think also back to what you were talking about is having a solid base. Someone else's opinion of me didn't, didn't, it's not fun when they're mean to you, but it, it doesn't destroy you. So you have this incident that we kind of scooted by. This is a photographer who was t- trying to take liberties with you or what was that story? If you don't mind. So I was getting ready to do, it was my first job. And the, the owner of the agency said it was a good friend of his. So I felt like, okay, I, it's, it's legit. It's going to be okay. We were to drive out to the Hamptons for a testing. And that's like where you get photographs. It helps the photographer. It helps the model. Everybody's working on developing their, their portfolio. Um, there's no money exchanged. It's just that that's the deal. You get the pictures. Then I was to come back and then go do the job. Um, a, a couple of days later, we're driving out there and he's just making me feel uncomfortable the way he's speaking. And I just thought, well, I've been a little sheltered. Maybe I'm just not used to, I, you know, a European person. I didn't know, um, if it was a cultural thing, I was misreading. So I said, what time are we going to be back tonight? And he says, oh, no, 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 not tonight. Um, Oh, I forgot to tell you, it's too much trouble to drive back and forth. So I got us a hotel. But there's only one room. Oh, and there's only one bed in the room. And and I'm just holding on to the door as we're driving along the freeway. He says, don't worry, you can have the bed. But in the night, I'm going to snuggle with you. So my brain was going a million miles an hour. Um, I didn't have back then it was a dime to make a phone call in a public phone. Didn't have that. Um, just wondering what I was going to do. Uh, get to the hotel and I immediately got the got on the phone, called my roommates, talked, not making any sense. They understood it. They sent someone to come get me and I got away. Um, still went back and did the job because I wanted the job and I wasn't going to let him take that. It was $300 a day. I wasn't going to let him take that from me. And, uh, but I told the editor of the magazine all about it. So she was very protective, but um, that was the beginning of really recognizing that there's a lot of people out there with different agendas and got to be really alert to that. In fact, uh, I wrote my first fiction with a, uh, New York Times bestselling author, Rachel Van Dyke, and it's called Fashion Jungle. And while it is fictitious, it's based on true stories about New York and the fashion industry. And it's really to kind of alert people of the underbelly of that business. When did things really start to break for you in that world? You know, I would say working with Julie Campbell and Sports Illustrated because it had such um, a broader audience. How old were you? I was 20. And I grew up on the beaches of Santa Barbara. I was a beach rat. Um, 
that was just uniform. I you know, always, you know, wore the swimsuit under the clothes. It wasn't a hoochie thing. It was just a practical uniform uh, under the clothes, riding the bike to school in case there was a detour to the beach. And uh, so swimwear was just, that was like a normal uniform. There were some that I wasn't comfortable wearing and Julie was always respectful for that. And, uh, and I certainly look back at, there's certainly choices I've made back then that I wouldn't make today, but what a gift to get to know Julie Campbell. She is amazing. We're still close friends. In fact, she's, uh, she does work with our company. She does design consulting She's in her 90s and uh, just brilliant. And I got to watch her navigate, fight for the integrity of her brand in a, in a really male-dominated field. And she really held her own, um, such a, a creative genius and so kind. Everywhere we would travel, she was always feeding the hungry dogs. Uh, they were under the table wherever the countries where we were visiting where dogs were not pets. She was feeding them. She was always taking care of the children. I remember being in Indonesia and we were on this small island, no cars. I don't think they had electricity. And Julie would always pack a suitcase full of Polaroid film and her Polaroid camera. And these children, they'd never seen an image of themselves and seeing it develop right before their eyes. It was so exciting. And I remember the photographer screaming because the light was perfect. And she'd say, no, 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 the children haven't all got their, their photos yet. <laughs> and I just loved how she had her priorities. It was the people came before the prophets. Do you ever remember at some point being overwhelmed? I mean, it was a it was a different time, you know. If you were on the cover of Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition, you were known throughout the land and and beyond this land. You know, you were in, you're internationally recognizable. Immediately, you go from you know pretty humble beginnings to this kind of explosion of fame at a very young age. Must have been lots of actors you know, agents calling you, wanting to go to lunch and all, all that goes along with that. Was it ever overwhelming for you? I, not so much. No. I mean, there was, um, it definitely had an impact yet. I was able to keep my personal life pretty separate from work life. And I like to focus on, you know, just the business hours and the business and and it worked out. It was um, not too overwhelming. You know, that seems like you were in a very good time for modeling because, you know, I don't know who the top models are today. Most people don't. But when you were doing it with all the models you were around, there was a supermodel probably coined about that that time, right? That, that phrase. And people knew who models were back then. I mean, you know models now, but your average person doesn't know like they did know back then. I mean, there were little, literally, you were a household name and Cindy Crawford's a household name and Naomi Campbell. And these were like household names and modeling. And I, so much of life is timing. You know, it's sort of like, I always kind of talk about, I like boxing. So we talk about the heavyweight division. You know, there's the time when you knew the Muhammad Ali's and the George Foreman's and the Joe Frazier's, like you knew all the heavyweights. And then there are other times in the early eighties, mid eighties, where it's like, you didn't know any of those names. So often it's not about who's the most gifted heavyweight. It's kind of like, how is your timing in life? So I, I hope you feel pretty blessed about your timing as well as your modeling. Oh, my goodness. Um, yes, I, I do feel that I, I grew up in, in a good time as well and, and worked in a good time. It's been um, just so fortunate in so many ways. And, and then I talk, I talk with women a lot who 
maybe are frustrated or they're discouraged. They're trying to start something. They've got an idea for a business or a brand. And, um, and oftentimes they'll, they'll say, well, you know, it's easy for you because you had that modeling background. Everybody knew who you were. And I recognize that and I appreciate that. And there is validity to that. At the same time, there's a real gift to having anonymity. And um, when you walk into a room, you're, it's a clean slate. And so you get to build your brand however you want. And I do acknowledge that there were doors that were opened because of that past career, but they weren't the right doors. They were doors of curiosity that would waste each other's time, didn't take my ideas as CEO seriously, and uh, ultimately, you know, didn't didn't go anywhere. So I would say to, to the person out there who didn't have a background like that, that can be a great gift if you've got that gift of anonymity. Yeah, I mean, you probably wasted your time on many a meeting where somebody just wanted to meet Kathy Ireland. <laughs> like, thought it'd be fun to have you come by the office and, and, and meet with And I think they're going to get a retouched, you know, image too. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, sorry, this is what you get. Well, you know, you're talking about going from this business to, you know, modeling to the, being an entrepreneur, and um, and it's true, your 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 name open some doors, but you know, I always kind of tell people, I always think of this as, as an example, like magic Johnson got a late night talk show, um, because he was magic Johnson, but 10 minutes into it, it wasn't magic Johnson, the basketball star we were looking at, we were looking at magic Johnson, the talk show host, <laughs> and he is being judged by his ability to be a talk show host and we can turn on you real fast. Like just because we know who you are, just because, I mean, there's no doubt he got the gig because Hey, magic Johnson, everyone loves magic Johnson. Right. Now he's going up against Leno and Letterman. Maybe we don't like him as much. Maybe we <laughs> like him on the court, but we don't like him sitting at the desk. And so, you know, this notion of, Oh, you can just, I get it sometimes because people go, well, your podcast is successful because you did radio and now people just know you and they just went, went along. And it's like, right, but not after 12 years. Like, you got to show up. You have to put out a product at a certain point. They're not just around because they recognize your name. You must right. have experienced absolutely. a lot of that. Oh, yeah, abs absolutely. And it's, um, you know, it, and I think it, goes back to one of the those gifts of modeling is the rejection so and learning I mean, there's always so much to learn I love when people are tough on, on me and uh, they love me enough to tell me the truth and and help me get better and you know I'll, I'll give you an example of that when when I worked as a model you know the job description it's basically it's shut up and pose. I mean, that, that, that's what it is. And I remember when I had a rare opportunity to speak and a critic uh, very publicly said I had a voice that could kill small animals. And, um, and I love animals, so I really hope they weren't injured. But I was 25 years old. I couldn't order a pizza on the phone because my voice was really squeaky. And so there was truth to it. There was truth to that criticism. And we got to look at the criticism, no matter how nasty it's delivered, to recognize if it's just garbage to be thrown away or if there's something that we can glean from it. And, uh, and that criticism was helpful. I got my pizzas after that, and, uh, and it was very helpful. Well, you know, I find with a lot of criticism, I've certainly been on the losing end of, of some criticism, you'll usually find that the person is an asshole and you usually find that the person doesn't like you, but it mm -hmm. still doesn't mean that what they were saying isn't true. Right. Yeah. It, it can be all of the above. They mm -hmm. can, they can be unfair. They can be assholes yeah. and they can dislike you, but they can still make points. And usually you should try to pick out those points and, 
it's easy just to kind of throw it away and go, well, that guy's an ass and he doesn't like me. And that's why they're saying this. It's easy to do sort of professionally and it's easy to do it, and on a, on a more intimate level as well. But there's usually something, there's some kernels of truth in there and it would behoove everyone to pick out those kernels and see if they could work on those kernels because otherwise you're just insulted. You really got nothing out of it. It's essentially, um, if you got robbed because you're walking down a dark street with a Rolex on and somebody stole your watch and you didn't learn not to walk down the dark street with the Rolex next time, then you really got nothing out of this. Right. Other than right. you're missing your, you're missing your watch. Yeah. So yeah. there are little things within the critiques that sometimes just seem to be bad faith. Like it just seems like the person's mean and they don't like you, but it's, there's usually things in there. And yeah, there can be some good gifts in there. It's painful, but I mean, gosh, I've, I've learned some good, good, valuable lessons from mean people. Yeah, I have, I have as well. And I, I, I wonder why some people, many people are just not receptive to it at all. I mean, they push back, they externalize, they, they fight it all the time. The, the, the externalizers, there's so many out there. How does one create an internalizer? And I think people think of that as swallowing a bunch of criticism or hostility and choking on it. it it's really not. It's just kind of going, what was my role in this? How could it basically it's like, how can we avoid this happening again? And maybe that person had a point, even if I don't like them. Right. Yeah. Or, you know, help me understand what you mean, because I might be hearing this incorrectly. But is there are you trying to offer me some good advice? Because if so, I'd like to learn from you and you can work on your delivery. It's like the it's like the man with the paper route. You know, his delivery was terrible. Um, and he was incorrect. You know, a girl can do a paper route just as well as a boy. He was wrong. Um, but, you know, there's always going to be the, the, the critics out there, but we just gotta, gotta face them and, and confront them. And I think, you know, we see a lot of online bullying and, uh, you know, I like, I call people out when they do that, not for myself, because it doesn't bother me. But I think people can feel that they're anonymous and they have this power and they can just like write untrue, unkind things about people and not get called out. And, uh, you know, there was a time when um, it it was a, a, a big executive guy saying things and it's like, oh, my goodness, you know, should you really be advocating violence? Is that really what you're intending? And um, he he was mortified, but actually was thankful expressed gratitude that I called him out on it. Was and, he the big executive guy talking about you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, you know, he didn't like something that I did. He had an opinion on it, but, um, I said something like I was on drugs and she, whoever hired me should be shot, you know, something like that. And I just said, you know what? I've got kids. Um, I'm not on drugs and we know a lot of people who really struggle with substance use disorder. So it's, it's not funny. And, uh, should you really be advocating violence also? I mean, it's just not okay. And he apologized. He said, Hey, I just felt like I was this anonymous person behind my computer. And, uh, and he, you know, he took it, he took it down and he said that he changed. And then I said, Hey, um, you didn't like, um, my work perhaps so you can give me some guidance. And, and he did. What was it in regards to? Oh, Adam, it was, a uh, it was a really, it was a really difficult time. Um, I was way out of my element and he was right. I wasn't great. Um, it was right after the 2010 earthquake in Haiti. And I just returned from there and have some dear friends who work with an organization called Child Hope and um, an orphanage. It was one of the few standing structures after the earthquake. So it was like the next day. Um, and when you experience suffering on that level, to then go into a different world that 
not to diminish it because people work really hard in the entertainment industry. People work really hard and they deserve to celebrate and they deserve to have all the accolades and awards. But my mindset, um, I was a million miles away and it was, it was for the Oscars and it was introducing people on the red carpet, you know, saying, Hey, how are you? Congratulations. That kind of thing. And he commented, I I think, I don't know what he said. I can't remember. I was stiff or something, but, um, which, which I was, uh, but the other comments are what I called him out on because I just said, you know what, if you're doing this to me, you're doing this to other people. And back to what you said at the beginning, having a base, I'm okay because you know I don't get my identity from your opinion of me. So I'm all right, but I don't want you doing this to someone else because you don't know what a person is going through in the course of a day. And Adam, especially today, we all see with um, shutdowns and people being isolated and, um, you know, just fear and a lot of things going on. Um, People are really vulnerable. And I think if anything, we've got to just be more patient and be more kind and just have a boatload of grace with people and just not jump to conclusions and be mean for entertainment's sake. Well, it's going to be a difficult question to answer, but I do feel like people who look like you look and have had the kind of success that you've had, people look at you as almost a, not a real person. You know, they kind of go, oh, cry me a river. She's got no problems. Look at her. You know what I mean? And there's also a kind of a kind of a esoteric thing, which is like, oh, she looks how she looks. And now she was, has the career that she has because that's how she looks. So I can say whatever I want about this person. It's kind of like, it's a weird analogy, but it just popped in my head. <clears throat> A lot of people wouldn't shoplift from a ma and pa store, but they would from a Walmart or Costco because they go, oh, they're done. They can handle it. They're fine. They'll be just fine. You know what I mean? You wouldn't do it to the little corner bodega, you know, and maybe with Kathy Ireland or, you know, George Clooney or whatever you go. Oh, like that guy has a problem. So I can say whatever I want. Did you ever? process that or, or think of, think of it that way? Because obviously you, you're you to you, but to the rest of us, you're the person with no problems. We can say whatever we want. <laughs> I mean, not, not so much about myself, but certainly with other people. I mean, I've, um, I, and I think it's our failed human nature. I think we can all do it. We can think of people, uh, and, almost a dehumanizing way, not recognizing, you know, that's, that's a human being. Maybe you don't agree with their policies or with uh, their style or whatever it is that they're selling or doing, but it's still, it's a human being. So we got to treat each other with at least respect. And, uh, and, and the definition of tolerance is showing respect for someone with whom you disagree. I'm very interested in your very close relationship with Elizabeth Taylor, Mm because it's another part of the story I didn't know until I took a little deep dive into you you, uh, yesterday when I was doing my homework. So I want to talk about that and her Oscar and all you owning that and all that. We'll do that in one second. First, I'll tell you about Tommy John. Tommy John. Oh, this is the best, best loungewear. Best um, sweats, best uh, underwear, best T-shirts. It's all Tommy John. Over 17 million pairs sold. Giving the gift of Tommy John has become a holiday tradition for many families across the country. Uh, They don't have customers. They have fanatics. Once you get into the Tommy Johns, you will not, uh, you'll not go anywhere else. I'm wearing mine now. They make everything, and especially as it gets a little cooler outside, the uh, loungewear and the pajamas around the house. So wonderful, so soft. Returns and exchanges are free, all backed by the best pair you'll ever wear. It's free. 
Guarantee, right, Dawson? Get 20% off your first order right now at TommyJohn.com slash Adam. That's TommyJohn.com slash Adam for 20% off. Order now so your gifts arrive before the holidays. TommyJohn.com slash Adam. See site for details. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back with Kathy Ireland, and we'll talk uh, Liz Taylor right after this. Kathy Ireland is with us. A very uh, a soothing soul you are, Kathy. You seem very... Aw, thank you. Yeah, I'm, as I get older, I'm starting to really realize that people just kind of have wiring. You, you know what I mean? And some people are wired like little fidgety lap dogs, and then others are big old Labradors who just want to kind of happy to be around you know what i mean and uh and i don't know if that's always been your wiring or it's your faith or it's your family or you work at it you know you you meditate or you're thoughtful or you work hard at this kind of wiring that you have which is very um it feels genuine and it, it feels inviting. It feels like, ah, oh, we can relax. Oh, but is that something well, you work thank, at? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I love Labradors. So um, thank you <laughs> for that. Uh, you know what, Adam, uh, your compliment is um, deeply appreciated. And I would just say any good thing, it comes from God. And I'm so grateful. I am a slow learner. I first found um, my faith in Jesus when I was 18. And uh, it was at the beginning of that modeling career. And I'm a slow, slow learner. Um, I, I came to to know him. I was staying in this apartment in Paris. And it was, I, it was just really lonely. It was, um, I didn't feel comfortable in that place. And it was in the middle of the night, just graduated from high school without telling me my mom, who had also just become a Christian at that time in nursing school, without telling me she stuck a Bible in my suitcase and never read one in my life. We never had one at home and uh, jet lag and boredom. I opened it up to the book of Matthew. And as I started reading, I just I knew what I was holding was the truth. And I was such a rebellious teenager. I was like, who really knows what's true? And and I just saw Jesus, not like what people told me he was, but like reading for myself. It's like, oh my goodness, he loves women and honors women. And so that changed my life. And I'm also such a slow, slow learner. So the very thing that led me to him was his word. I neglected it. So I would read parts that I liked, and then I would read other parts that I was sure was a cultural thing, or it was a translation or a typo didn't pertain to me. So I was trying to mold God into what I wanted him to be rather than just allowing him to make me into the person he made me to be. Um, And there's a, a verse that says the one who has been forgiven much loves much. So I love a whole bunch. It's interesting that you and your mom came on to this as adults. I mean, you technically at 18, you know, and you kind of wonder, like, is there some biology that you guys share? Like, it's interesting that your mom got, came upon Jesus Christ and as, as you were, I know she put the Bible in, in the Samsonite, so that helped, but I mean, it wouldn't have worked if you were just whooping it up in Paris. I guess most it doesn't seem like most people find Jesus Christ in Paris when they're modeling. Yeah. It seems like they find cocaine and older dudes from um, OPEC nations. But <laughs> good thing you found that, not the coke. Well, it was a good. It was a good thing, also. I think that, in a way, that I was in that environment because I was so rebellious, and so this gave me oh. an outlet to rebel in a healthy way. It's like, no, I'm not going to your party. Yeah, that's interesting. Right. So if you're rebelling, it's almost how if your parents were hippies, you'd rebel by working on Wall Street and wearing a three-piece suit. Like we don't think of that as rebelling, but it is rebelling in your environment or from your environment. So uh, Elizabeth Taylor, how did, how did that friendship come about? Oh, Elizabeth Taylor. Um, amazing. I, oh, just larger than life. I met Elizabeth through, I mentioned John Carrasco. He is our worldwide genius creative director. And Elizabeth's creative director, Tim Mendelson, 
um, they're good friends. And that's how we met. And Tim knew that I wanted, I just, I wanted to learn from Elizabeth. I love to learn from people. And he's like, well, why don't you just write her a letter? And and so I did. How, and, how old were you at the time? Oh, goodness. I was in my 30s. So this was a while ago, a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, late 30s. Um, but took a took a deep breath and uh, and wrote that letter and she responded and just immediately so genuine and what an amazing business person I, I mean I would experience Elizabeth go through every business contract she knew her stuff always thinking always designing and you know she's what a life, you know, you were talking about when somebody has a life that's so large and people, you know, you're almost dehumanized. The things that Elizabeth went through, I don't think we'll ever have another movie star like Elizabeth. The world has changed so much. Her philanthropy, her fight for others, she's just fierce in the fight against AIDS. Elizabeth, just like she would not give up, didn't matter if people gave her death threats. She went on to fight. And um, I have the privilege of serving as an ambassador for Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation. And Elizabeth was one of the very first people who was so known, who came out and was very open about um, her substance use disorder. And our company, we just recently opened recovery centers with our partners at Ascension. Our first one is in Laconia, New Hampshire. And uh, it I don't know anybody who's not impacted by this. And another company that we're working with, it's Let's Talk Interactive, and it's online medical. It's Art Cooksey leads this. And just a, a wonderful way to get tangible help affordable help to people who need it most. And Elizabeth, she inspires everything we do. I mean, from every sector of business, she was always encouraging me to be bolder and stronger and um, just absolutely amazing. She was also quite an artist as well. I don't think people knew that about her. I'm sorry? She was quite an artist. I don't oh, think people my knew goodness, Adam, that about she her. Would, so we were in Las Vegas. It, it was at a, a jewelry market and Elizabeth saw this tumbleweed rolling along the road. It's like, stop the car. And she just wanted to see it. She saw such beauty in this big dusty old tumbleweed. And at night, in the middle of the night, she's sketching and she's drawing this, this necklace. It was so beautiful. This necklace that you could see the tumbleweed inspiration but with diamonds everywhere and just beautiful she had an eye like no other she'd go into her safe and it was like pirates of the caribbean it was so much fun just it, it, and she had such respect you know she'd say um we don't own these these are we're stewards of them and we've got to care for them and and respect them and it was just such such a joy and not, privilege. Not about tumbleweeds, but about fine jewelry. Right? Well, yeah, she had she had some pretty big diamonds. But what a lot of people don't know, I mean, Richard Burton, there was a, this amazing diamond he bought her. They were in Africa. She recognized that the people who live there don't have the same access to health care that she and Richard enjoyed. So she sold the diamond on the spot and opened up a hospital in Africa. I mean, that's what she was doing. And even with her AIDS philanthropy, she was so passionate about it. I was going to say controlling, but passionate about it. I mean, controlling, you think in a good way, in the best way. And she set up um, clinics and portable clinics all over Africa. When Katrina hit, she was there with the portable vans just instantaneously. And so much of what Elizabeth did was done quietly and just, she just would do what was right. And she was a fighter and nobody was going to get in her way. And I guess pretty inspirational to you, certainly spiritually, but from an entrepreneurial standpoint, 
probably taught you a oh, lot. Yeah. yeah, a lot. Yeah, there's a there's a lot to learn from people. And I feel like maybe it's the theme of this conversation, but people <laughs> do way too much. Leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. And I'm like, or why not why not go learn yeah. from that? from, from those other people, especially. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about, I mean, you have so many interesting guests on your show who have been some of the people who you've learned the most from. Well, just at the top of my head, um, Brian Grazer, who, you know, we all know the name Brian Grazer is a wildly successful guy. Um, and I, I don't want to sell him short, but you know, he's not a comedian. He's not really a writer. He's not an actor. He, he kind of puts people together, you know, if you really think about his job. And he was a guy who's uh, on our theme of he would find people he thought were interesting and he would just sit down with them and talk to them for extended periods of time. And he would always do that when he was sort of coming up. And then at some point he became Brian Grazer and I remember a story from very early in, in my career when uh, I got the word from my agent that Brian Grazer wanted a meeting with me. And I was like, ooh, Brian Grazer and Ron Howard. And, ooh, maybe they want to do a movie with me or they want me to write it or star in it or something. And I was like, of course. And went down to big high rise in Century City with the you know, big mahogany table and doors and leather and corner office. And I... I just sat down with Brian Grazer because he wanted to have a meeting. And we, we sat and talked for, I don't know, two hours. And then, uh, and then we were done. And then like a week went by and then another week went by and a month went by. And I, I said to my agent, like, well, what, what, what did Brian Grazer want? Like, I thought we were talking about doing a project or something here. I was pretty excited about this. And it's like, yeah, I don't know. We've not gone back to us. And then I interviewed Brian Grazer on my podcast. 15 years later. And he just said, uh, Oh, I would find people I thought were interesting and just bring them in, talk to them. <laughs> I was like, well, you got to tell them you're not going to do anything with them. And it's like, well, but people know me and they think we're going to, that's how he would lure them in. And I thought, well, that guy just wants to sit with people. He didn't seem to discriminate too much. Cause I mean, I wasn't exactly, you know, big star or anything, but he thought what I was saying was interesting or something. And he just wanted to, wanted to talk. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of people in, uh, on the show and, and it, the, the theme is curiosity. They're curious, all the successful people, they, they're very curious. They're not a lot of, you know, my way or the highway. They're more like, and tell me more about what you do and how it works and how you're successful. So they have this real curiosity and that then leads to success. You know, you first have to have the asking why, and then the success comes from the questions that are, are answered after that. So his name just popped into my head, but talk to a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people. They're all, they're all from different facets and walks of life, but they do all have that same curiosity thing. And I'm, I wish we could teach that somehow. I'm not sure how to teach it. Some people just seem uh, yeah, to be that I way. I think children have it naturally. And I think it probably gets, I don't know, beat out of them somehow. Yeah. I could remember, um, you know, early as someone with a sense of humor, but nowhere to go with it when I'd be hanging out with my friends, 16 years old, and I'd go, why is it blah, blah, blah. And I'll stand at like a Seinfeld bit, you know, and they'd go, I don't know. Who cares? Shut up, asshole. And I'd be like, oh, I guess, I guess you're not that curious. So I've, I've found sadly that most aren't. And as, as much as it feels like second nature to you or such a part of your life. Sadly, it's just yeah. not a big part of maybe even our culture. Maybe we mm. need more of it, you know, sort of globally or, mm. or macro instead of uh, microly. Um, Kathy, yeah, there's a lot of apathy. I mean, for sure. Yeah. I just, I, it, I, I look, it's one of those things I'm not, 
religious like you, but I, I, I hope that people are blessed with curiosity. I would definitely say it that way. It does not seem to be something that you necessarily cultivate or earn, although it builds on itself. But some people are just very curious and others do not seem to be that way. And it really just seems like a blessing to me, mm. which yeah. can sometimes be a curse for a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me give you a, a plug. Blackbird is the name of the album and it's uh Billy Davis Jr. and Marilyn McCoo, who we, if you're of a certain age, you will definitely remember them, but they're, uh, they're back and it's released on uh, Kathy's new record label, EE1. And uh, also there's a Walton's Homecoming movie. It's re-airing on the uh, CW December 12th. So you can uh, watch that as well. KathyIreland.com is where you can go, or you can shoot her a, uh, a tweet as long as it's complimentary with maybe just a little bit of criticism <laughs> in there, just enough to grow <laughs> off of at Kathy Ireland. Uh, Kathy, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, Adam, thank you. You know what? I'm going to give a, a shout out to you. You were so kind, um, with that. Um, you know, the Waltons, my, my dear friend, Sam Haskell, Magnolia Hill, and, um, Marilyn McCoo, Billy Davis, Jr. Blackbird. They sing silent night in the Waltons homecoming and just quest love just, um, just did a, a amazing film with them and they're, they're just doing incredible, incredible things. But you mentioned Twitter, um, and summer of soul and it, it, it won Sundance awards. Um, just amazing people. Uh, you mentioned Twitter and if anybody wants to contact me, I need something. If anybody knows anybody who knows Dwayne Johnson, the rock, I thank Vanessa Williams. Um, she is amazing and she's searching, searching, uh, as well as some dear friends of mine. We know it. There's a, a little five-year-old boy. His name is Jet. He's got a really for rare form of cancer, and his wish is to meet the Rock. So please, uh, Kathy Ireland at KathyIreland.com, if anyone knows anyone who knows anyone. She never stops doing the Lord's work. Thank you so much, Kathy. Hope we can uh, see Aww. each other soon. Me too. Thank you, Adam. All right. Last but not least, there's Clavio. Holidays are here. And uh, unconventional gifts. Well, those are the best ones, like owning your data and growth with Clavio, which leads to customer and brand loyalty. Whether you're an entrepreneur or you're growing a startup or you're a longtime visionary evolving your company, Clavio is an email and SMS marketing platform that helps you own your growth. Clavio. Boost your marketing by giving you the tools you need to own and uh, access data you've sourced from customers. Using their customer-first data is like uh, homemade versus uh, store-bought cookies. We all know which one's better. You can tell the difference. When you own your data, you own your growth. Learn more at klaviyo.com slash holidays. That is K-L-A-V-I. Y-O.com slash holidays. All right. We're going to be in Portland. That's coming up December 22nd and 23rd, doing some live stand up there and uh, live podcasting there. So say hi. That'll be at Helium Comedy Club. And then before then, Brea Improv, the 15th, doing the live shows there, taping, taping the stand up specials there. TJ Miller, Patrick Warburton is going to be there. You can check out our chassis channel, chassis channel 687 on Pluto. TV and until next time, it's Adam Corolla for Gina and Bald and Kathy Ireland. Say it. Mahalo. Don't is know what they are. For everyone who's going in the army. This just says this is their updated requirement. I feel like we just need to go look. Certain groups of these people are just gonna stay stateside and work drones Desks. with a joystick. They're gonna translate, they're gonna pilot drones. Right. We don't we don't we don't need you guys away. to do anything. <laughs> You just got to have that, you know, don't joystick, have carpal tunnel. Yeah, joystick wrist has right. to be top shape.